Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 1 through 13. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was, in, he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world, and though the, through the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or of husband's will, but born of God. You'll bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you today to worship you, for you are worthy of all glory, all honor, all praise. And Father, our hearts so many times aren't focused on you, especially with all of our heart, our, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. So Lord, we ask your forgiveness as we come before the throne, that we may not only be children because of your amazing grace and the, the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ, our Lord, but, Lord, just that we have been given the breath of life, not only to live as human beings, as flesh and blood, but to be spiritual beings that will live for all eternity because of those things that you have done, that it was your will to call us to, to glory, to call us back from our sins and from our death into a glorious light. Lord, we just pray that we live as children of light. Open our hearts and ears to hear your words today, Lord, to apply them to our lives so that we may be the light of the world, that we may be gathering with Jesus rather than scattering and, get, and storing up treasures in heaven, Lord, rather than building and worrying about kingdoms of this earth. Lord, help us our eyes to see not just the things of this world, but the spiritual things, and help us to fix our eyes on Jesus as you fill us with your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll continue today through Luke chapter 11, and I wanted to, um, to be, to, our scripture reading from John so that we realize why Jesus came into this world and that he came in as light so that we would shine as light because Satan masquerades around as an angel of light. And you better be careful because sometimes the light that you think you see in others and in, even in yourself or maybe even especially in yourself is it the true light of Jesus Christ shining? Or is there some darkness, some hypocrisy? Because in the days of Jesus, you would have thought the Pharisees were the light of men in the world. But most of them were not. They walked in darkness. They were blind, leading the blind. And they would not only go into destruction, but they would lead others ignorantly into destruction, even though they thought they were light. Do you realize how truly blessed you are to have the Bible in the way it is today? In whatever version you have in your hand, whether it's on the phone or tablet, whether you listen to it audibly, whether you read it in paper form or whatever, you are one of the most blessed generations to this day because of the continued age that you have in reading your Bible and the different versions and everything else. And you have chapters and you have verses. <coughs> Um, page numbers, everything else to find in God's Word. And as I read along in God's Word, I'm reminded that there wasn't those chapter breaks, there wasn't those things, but there's also they're there to help us understand that others have labored intensively since the day that we got the Bible in, in, in so many ways fighting for it to be here today, but in helping us to have a copy of whatever version is best read for you punctuated the way that, it, that will help you do it so that you can read and understand God's Word. And then you have the Holy Spirit 
guiding you into that truth to sanctify you true and true to be like Jesus in this world. Do you realize that? Are you eating and consuming the Word of God as though not only it was the food for your eternal soul, but it was a delicacy. It is a delicacy. Are any of you familiar with beluga caviar? It is considered the best delicacy in the world. An ounce, or a pound rather, of beluga caviar can cost you $2,500 a pound. It's a delicacy that a lot of you won't even ever eat in your lifetime. Probably don't care to, but I'm comparing this to how you consume God's Word. Do you realize how precious it is? That the cost of God's Word is Jesus Christ became flesh and blood, the light of the world, and He died for you so that you could be bought back from your sin, from death, to have eternal life, to be a child of God, and so that you could live like a child of light. And I entitle this children of the true light because you better be careful that you're filled with light and not darkness. The caviar is the, the fish eggs or the, the roe. It comes from the beluga sturgeon, which is found only in the Caspian Sea. It takes many years before it has eggs, and then the eggs are the largest of the caviar version. There are different colors of it. You want to look for the right color, and when you get that right one, and you bite down on it on a cracker or a piece of bread because you don't want anything to distract from the taste of the caviar, it pops in your mouth. Not snap crackle pop, not, not Rice Krispies, but a pop of flavor that just excites all of your taste buds. And you've tried one of the most delicious, most costly foods in the world. Do you consume this every day the way you would consume food? Do you realize how precious it is and that the words of God are eternal, they do not change, and they lead to life so that you can live life? Do you indulge on God's word for the cost that it was to men and the cost it was to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For the Word became flesh and dwelled among us so that we could be, by faith, called children of God. Wow. Do you savor? Do you taste? Do you consume? Do you prepare like you prepare your food? Do you pray? Do you apply it to your life? Do you exercise and train so that you handle the Word of God with truth? Do you study? You have commentaries out there and sermons out there to listen to and read in abundance like no generation has ever had before. Do you do that because you think that the Word of God, you know that the Word of God is a delicacy and that it leads to life. Life abund abundantly, life eternally. Life that will glorify your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And in His suffering and death, as you suffer and die with Him to the ways of the world, you will be raised up into glory and understand the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. The first major parable in Luke was the parable of the sower and the seed. Jesus explains that parable to His disciples. And He tells them to pay careful attention to hear and not only hear, but to understand and apply the words of God, even in parable form, so that they understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, so that they can apply them, they can hold on to them, and by persevering they can produce a crop, whatever that crop is. What farmer would come to plant seed to not expect a crop produced? And those seed that fell upon noble and good hearts produced a crop in various forms. So are you producing a crop in your life? Are you seeing that? Do you have a disciple that you're training up? Because we're supposed to go and make disciples, therefore, and train them up to obey everything that God has taught us. Are you looking and searching for that if you don't have one so that if you have the opportunity and someone asks you about Jesus, that you say, I'm willing to take the time, I'm willing to take the effort to train this person up so that they will continue on. Because if you don't continue on, are you going to leave it up to someone else to do? We're supposed to train up disciples to follow in God's Word, and especially our children and our grandchildren, so that they will continue in the ways of the Lord. 
Are you writing his commandments in your heart on the doorpost of, of, of your houses? Are you talking about him when you get up and go around and when you sit down and when you, when you go to bed and when you rise? Are you praying and studying God's word and consuming on it? Or are you distracted about the physical things of this world because you're only seeing with your physical eyes rather than letting your eyes be spiritual eyes? It's the lens to your heart and your soul. After that parable, Jesus warned them that there were many that would be seeing but never perceiving, hearing but never truly understanding. In Luke 8, verses 16 to 18, we read these words of Jesus. No one lights a lamp and covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, he sets it on a stand so those who enter can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will, be disclo- that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be made known and brought to light. Pay attention, therefore, to how you listen. Whoever has will be given more, but whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away from him. So the question here that Luke has presented back a few chapters ago was, do you have a lamp? Is it burning? You either believe in Jesus Christ or you don't. You believe in Him and trust that He is the Messiah, the One of God, the Chosen One that would come to take away the sins of the world. And if you do believe that, you've become His disciple. You choose to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Him. You choose to come after Him and be a fisher of men. Let Him make you into that. You leave the world behind because the world doesn't matter because you're a new creation in Jesus Christ. Born not of flesh and blood, but born of the Spirit of God that you can cry out through the Holy Spirit, Daddy, Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, not my own. Let me be satisfied with daily bread. Let me forgive others because I know that I am forgiven. Lead me not into temptation because I'm being led by the Holy Spirit to walk in the ways of the Spirit, to realize the gifts the Spirit has given us and walk in the the steps with the Spirit producing fruits that the Spirit produces in our lives. For we are not what we used to be. That man is dead and gone. We are to be like Christ in this world, shining because our lamps have been lit lit by Jesus Christ and we shine and reflect the glory of our Lord and Savior who is at the right hand of the Father pleading that we are His children. No one would light a lamp and cover it. Instead, they put it out for all in that household to see. Now, the reason I go back here is because Jesus' words echo this again where we're at in Luke 11. And I finished last week by, by summing it up and pointing that back to us. But in Luke 11, Jesus is really talking about himself as being the lamp. And I'll, I'll show you that today. There are many times that Jesus used this teaching in in different places. Don't be surprised that he didn't use some of the same teaching methods or some of the same teaching curriculums throughout his ministry. But they can be applied in different ways. You've got to realize that your lamp has been lit if it has, and there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed. Jesus doesn't need to worry about that for himself because he is a spotless lamb that laid down his life for his sheep. But you might think that you're a lamp shining for Jesus. But if you're still living for the things of the world, are you truly shining for Jesus? Be careful about the darkness that is there and how great that darkness is. Nothing is hidden from God's sight. It will be disclosed. You will be accountable for everything you do, every idle thought. For you belong to Him if you belong to Him. And you are with Jesus or against Jesus. It's black or white. And you're either scatter, either gathering or scattering. So therefore, as Jesus said here, pay attention how you listen to God's Word. That it doesn't go in one ear and out the other. That it doesn't go in on a stone heart. That it goes on a heart of flesh because it's supposed to impact you to action. You can't come into church or listen to sermons elsewhere or read your Bible and not sit there and say, God, how can this be applied to my life so I can be more like Christ? On the road to Emmaus, it burned within them how Jesus described the Scriptures pointing to Him so that they would be like Him in this world. Forever changed a new creation in Jesus Christ. And there's a promise here. Whoever has been given... 
Whoever is given more will be given more because they did something with it. They're more responsible, more accountable. And I can go to many scriptures that tell us the same thing. But if you are a child and you've been given your inheritance and you do nothing with it, then be careful whatever you even have that you think that you have, it says in verse 18, will be taken from you because you might be an illegitimate child. You're certainly a child that's not using what God has given you. It's like having a bank account and having an unlimited balance and an unlimited number of checks. Are you writing those checks? Because God has given you your spirit to be kind and considerate and hospitable and loving and everything else. Are you living that? Because that, that bank account is never ending for you to dip into. Are you struggling with sin because you haven't laid them down and asked the spirit to take it from you? What heavenly father, our heavenly father in heaven, wouldn't give good gifts to a child if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children? So keep asking, keep knocking. He's not like that friend at midnight. He is your father in heaven. Keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking, and he will answer you and he will give you the Holy Spirit to make you more like Christ. Will the Holy Spirit help you overcome that addiction or whatever it is? Of course. But the end goal is so that you can be more like Christ, a witness in this world, because salvation has come to men. Today is the day of salvation, not the day of judgment yet, but that day will come. Jesus will come and it will be as a thief in the night to many. But us that have our lamps burning brightly and everything are expectantly waiting our Father and we will receive Him or receive Jesus with glory. The question here is, has your lamp been lit? And secondly, is it shining brightly for all to see? Because who in the world would light a lamp and then hide it? And then like I said, Jesus tells that there will be a reward for those that hear and obey. In fact... He says that that's who his family is, the true members of his family, those that hear the word of God and obey it. So now we're here in chapter 11, and Jesus says, no one lights a lamp and puts it in a cellar or under a basket. Very similar words. Instead, he sits it on a stand so those who enter can see the light. Same type words, similar words, however you want to put it, but they're having a different point to it. Because Jesus is saying he is the light of the world. Because what's happened here in Luke 11 is his disciple, one of his disciples came to him and asked him how to pray. And then we do, Jesus does this miracle of healing this man that has been demon-possessed and the demon keeps him from speaking. And the crowds and the religious say, no, we need another sign. The crowds do before we're going to believe. How many signs do you need? And the religious say, oh, that sign that you just performed was by the power of Satan, not by the power of God. So Jesus is saying here, if you read carefully and study your scriptures carefully so you can rightly handle the word of truth, he is saying to those skeptics, to those who want more, because there's no way I'm going to give up my rights as being Lord of my life for your rights of being Lord of my life unless you really prove it. Jesus is saying, I am the light. It's clear for you to see. It's not hidden. You have to accept that light and let me light you or you will forever be in darkness. Instead, he sets it on a stand so that those who enter can see the light. Jesus obviously was the light of men. He did my, many mighty miracles. John said he did more than, than what could ever be recorded in, in words so that you might believe. And Ruth writes his gospel so that you, knowing what you say that you believe, will live it. And then he continues on writing the acts of the church, or acts of the apostles, however you want to say the acts is, the acts of the Holy Spirit in God's children, living it out in this world. In verse 20. 28, he had said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Have you heard God's word? Are you obeying it because it has changed your heart? And God is writing on that heart of flesh rather than that heart of stone so that you will be like Jesus in this world. You would be a fool to say that your lamp has been lit by Jesus going back to chapter 8 and then hiding it. 
Do you believe Jesus is the light of the world or not? Has your lamp been lit and is it shining brightly for all to see or is it placed somewhere over in the corner or even worse, covered up? But wait a minute. You've got to consider here in Luke chapter 11, who lit your lamp? Because the Pharisees thought their lamps were lit by God. Come on. None of them thought they were dying and, and dying in their sins. And neither did the world that saw them that day. They saw the Pharisees as the one who would be the ones that gained heaven, if anything. And Jesus said, but if, you, if you don't, your righteousness doesn't exceed that of the Pharisees, you'll never enter in. Because they're just hypocrites. They're actors on a stage wearing a mask, thinking they're playing the roles that they really are, and you think they are also because they're playing that role. So who has lit your lamp? The people in chapter 11 demand for more signs or they are testing Jesus to see if He is the one that He claims to be. The Son of God, the Savior of the world. Their lamps had not been lit by Jesus. But oh yeah, they were shining. And their light was going into destruction and leading others on a path that would lead them to destruction. Jesus is the light of the world, the light of all men who will believe. And He cannot be hidden. Do you believe and are your lamp, is your lamp shining for all to see? You are called to be the light of the world. But you cannot be the light of the world unless Jesus has lit you and there is no more darkness in you so that you're shining brightly. If we go back to more words where Jesus is used like this, we'll go back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill which cannot be hidden. A group of lights. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they sit it on a sand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, in the same example, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So that light shining leads me to a life of good deeds. I cannot be the same. I cannot just be quiet. I can't take God's Word and hide them in my heart and go sit in my room and not go out there in the world. I can't not care for the widows and the orphans. I cannot fight for injustice in this world. And I cannot procl not proclaim Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. Because it's who I am. I am a new creation in Christ. Later on in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, verse 19, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth, moth and rust destroy. Okay, should I, should I do, do treasures at all? What, 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 here? And where th thieves break in and steal. But a complete opposite. Stir up, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So it's okay to go pursue these things, to store up treasures, to live a life of worth. But we're supposed to build up spiritual treasures in heaven, not earthly treasures. Where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. So I have to stop here and examine... How many times am I spending my life building up earthly treasures compared to building up earthly treasures? Worldly, heavenly treasures, sorry. How much do I, time do I spend in the here and now physically versus fixing my eyes on heaven and building up things there? And of course, so, conversions of souls and training up disciples would be number one in that. How much time do I spend? Have you sat down and, and thought about it and, and put it down? How many times, how many hours of the day do you prepare your food, clean up your dishes, eat your meal, go shopping for it, everything else compared to reading God's Word? And then you do that physical eating so that you can get up the next day and go to work or whatever because you can't without the nutrition for your body. You can't do the spiritual life without the nutrition for your soul. Oh, and then there's the prayer in there and the awareness of the Spirit and, and walking in step with the Spirit, everything else, that exercising and everything that goes with the nutrition. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
Oh, that changes things, doesn't it? So my eyes are still fixed on earthly things rather than, than spiritual heavenly things because I'm too much focused on here. But, oh, yeah, but i got to eat physically so that I can... But are you eating as much spiritually? Are the words of God more precious than if you had a chance to eat bulgur caviar? Next words here. The eye is the lamp of the body. What does that mean? If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? All right, I've got to go from physical to spiritual again. I see that Jesus is talking about that. He's not talking physically about my eyes, but yet he is talking physically. What are my eyes looking at? What are they fixed on? Are they fixed on my career? Are they fixed on my family? Are they fixed on my health? Are they fixed on things? Oh, let's not even put in there they're fixed on sinful things because I watch this that I shouldn't watch. I do this that I shouldn't do. What are my eyes fixed on? And then the spiritual implications of that. Am I taking a chance to see and see the physical beauty out there and not just spending time in it, fishing and hiking stuff, but thanking God for His beauty in this creation? Am I seeing people as souls? Or do I see them as, oh, if that guy would get off his tail and go work, he wouldn't be in the condition that he's in. How do I view things? And then how am I going to act upon it? Am I going to let my light shine that I do good deeds and it glorifies my Father in heaven? Am I storing up treasures in heaven rather than concentrating and storing them up here on earth? Okay, I think my eyes are full of light, but is there darkness? Let me sit down and think what they are and ask God to take them from me. I can't do them. I can't do them on my own. One of the things when I said when I'd become pastor was, Lord, I can't be your pastor because every once in a while my mouth is disgusting. And what he said to me is, you've tried that before, and it didn't work, did you? Do you want me to take it from you? And he did. I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. I can become more and more like Christ as I feed and consume on the delicacy of His Word. And I have it in so many different things. It's like putting all those plates out in front of you. You say, oh, let me try this, let me try that. I listened to a sermon yesterday somewhere. I don't remember where I was. Maybe in the airport sitting waiting. I don't remember. And the guy was reading from the message. And I forgot, oh yeah, I hadn't met, read from the message this week. Because I was like, that's a strange... Uh, version he's reading from and then I recognized it immediately because of the type of language it was in. I was like, that's the message. And it was refreshing. We have all those different versions that we can read. And then we can study the words. We can go into the root words. We can go into commentaries and everything else. And of course we can pray to our Heavenly Father and how much more will He reveal His Spirit to us to guide us into all truth. Look at the next verse though. If there's any darkness in me, how great is that darkness? Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other or will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Wait a minute, I thought that I was full of light. I thought I was serving God. I thought I was loving Him with all my heart, my mind, and soul. But if I sit down and take an account and do a check and balance system, I'm coming up short. Father, forgive me and guide me into the light of Christ. And we have a Father who is faithful and just if we admit our sins to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Going forward in Luke just a hair, in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, it says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father is pleased to give you this kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide yourself with purses that will not wear out. An inexhaustible treasure in heaven. So not only do we build up treasures in heaven, but there is, like I said before, that checking account. You cannot drain it. You cannot run out of checks. The, the, the ATM is never closed. However you want to look at it. Where no thief approaches, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Next verse. 
Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. Do you get all this? Can you tie it together? Has Jesus lit your lamp and is it burning brightly? Verse 36, Then you'll be like servants waiting for their master return from the wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him at once. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds on watch when he returns. So now we've got that Jesus is the light of the world. If he lights our lamp, we should be totally different, shining for the world, doing good deeds for all the world to see. It's, a, it's something we're going to continually read in God's Word and rely on the Spirit and confess our sins and know that we're tied together as a body, that we're all different supporting ligaments and elements and everything else. And we've got to do this with perseverance so that we produce a crop, helping each other run this race, getting, away, getting rid of anything that, that hinders us and the sins that entangles us, picking each other up along the way, fixing our eyes on Jesus, so that when the master returns, he finds his bride adorned and ready to meet him. Many think they've been illuminated because they do good works, or because they go to church, or because they read their Bible, or because they came from a Christian family, or because they're citizens of the United States, or whatever it is, or they're just religious. That's where we are in Luke chapter 11. The world said, i got to have more proof. And the religious said, I don't need any proof because i got it figured out. And Jesus rebuked them. So you don't have it figured out. Jonah went to the Nineveh and they did repent in ashes and, sackcloth, ashes and sackcloth. Queen of Sheba went to find Solomon with all his wisdom so that she could be changed by his wisdom. And someone greater than that is standing before you and you know it because of the signs that, that have been performed. And if I do these signs, who do yours do them by? Is it the finger of God or not? Do you need more proof? I am the light of the world and I am not hidden from you. Either let me light your lamps or don't. But people refuse the light of the world for whatever reason it is. Oh, John 3 is pretty clear about that. Well, first in John 1, the true light, verse, John 1 verse 9, the true light who gives light to every man has come into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of blood, nor of the desire of will, but born of God. That's where we started this morning when Walt read that. Is that where you are? Because John 3, verse 19 says this is the verdict. The light has come into the world, but man loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. But I don't like to think of myself that way. I like to think of myself as good and righteous. Oh, I'm be careful, or I'm a hypocritical Pharisee. Because none are righteous, no, not one. I am a sinner saved by grace from death into life, a new creation in Jesus Christ if I put my faith and trust in Him. Everyone who does evil hates the light. I don't like to think that, but it's the truth. And does not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. That's why Nicodemus came to Jesus. And he came to him at night. <laughs> but whoever practices the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen clearly what he has done has been accomplished in God. Later in John chapter 12, verse 36, he says, While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of the light, so that you're like Christ in this world. The problem is, is there's so many people that look like lights, but Jesus will say to them on that day, Depart from me, I do not know you. But Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. I don't know you, depart from me. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for those who everybody thought were light, but the light they had was a masquerading of light because their father was the devil. 
Later in John chapter 12, verse 44, then Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me does not believe in me alone, but in the one who sent me. And whoever sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as light so that no one who believes in me should remain in darkness. As for anyone who hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge them. For I have not come to the, come to the world, I have not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not receive my words. The word that I have spoken will judge him on that last day. I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me has commanded, commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I speak exactly what the Father has told me to say. Do you understand this about the light? Has your light been lit by Jesus Christ? I hope that's true of everyone here. But I also know if that is true, that not everyone's light here is shining as brightly as they should. Because I can say that for myself. So the first thing I've got to do is realize the darkness that is still within me so the light will expose it so that I walk more like Jesus in this world. If I sin, as John says, I have an advocate to plead my case and my sins will be forgiven. So here we are in Luke chapter 11, verse 33. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a cellar or under a basket. Instead, he sets it on a stand so those who enter can see the light. Have you entered? Do you see the light? Do you know the light? Are you just professing it? Are you denying it? Are you wanting more signs? Are you stuck in your religious hypocrisy saying, I'm okay? Or are you like the man that beat his breast and said, Father, forgive me, a sinner that I am. If you've come to Jesus that way, you're saved, you're forgiven, you're a child. But it's a lifelong process in being transformed and totally sanctified and set apart and living for God, something that we have to consume God's Word and pray and, and, and dwell the power of the Spirit each and every day. And especially in certain circumstances coming in our life, we need to feed and, and do that much more. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are good, your whole body is full of light, but when they are bad, your body is full of darkness. We read those words from Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is saying them here in a little different application again. He went from himself, I'm the light of the world, I'm not hidden, to your eye as the lamp of your body. How do you see me? How do you see the world? How do you see your sin? How do you see others? Do you have compassion for them? Constantly in Luke's gospel, Jesus had compassion upon the crowds. And he fed them the words of life and light, regardless if they would walk away from him. Regardless if they only wanted their bellies full or their demons expelled for that day, whatever it was. But Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Do you say that he's the Messiah, the ones that have the words of life? Will you follow him? Because you can't serve two masters. You'll serve one or the other. You will love and be devoted to one or the other. You'll be with Jesus or against Jesus. You'll be gathering or you'll be scattering. So if my eye, physical and spiritual, because I see things, oh, little eyes, be careful what you see. <laughs> and whenever I see something like that, it's hard to get that image back out, isn't it? And so many times in this world, it comes randomly when I didn't want to see it and it came in there at the grocery store or wherever. <laughs> and it's still in your mind and you have to ask God to take that from you. and You have to fill yourself with things from above rather than things from below and realize when that person cuts you off on the road and almost kills you that he doesn't know any better. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Verse 35, Be careful then... Be careful. Words from Jesus himself that the light within you is not darkness. He didn't say be careful that you're not got darkness. He said the light that is in you. Because the Pharisees were shining before men, leading others into darkness with them. They thought they had light. No one here that's here today doesn't think they have some kind of light shining in them. 
So be careful then that that light that is within you is not really darkness masquerading as light. And we're going to get to those examples in just a second. The religious, like I said, thought they were lights, but they were lights illuminated by their father, the devil. They thought they were holy. They had the appearance of holy. They thought they did good works. They even cast out demons if that was the case. But did they know the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ? Did they profess Him with their mouths and believe in their heart that He is Lord and they were saved from their sins? Verse 36, So if your whole body is full of light, with no part of it darkness, then what will you be? You'll be radiant as though a lamp were shining on you. You will be like your Father in heaven you won't be able to be hidden because Jesus is not hidden from the world. He did the will of the Father. He spoke the words of the Father. And you're to do the same. You are aliens and foreigners in this world. You are ambassadors of Christ as though God was making His plea of salvation through you. You are the bride of Christ, the hands and feet of Christ. Is that how you believe and is that how you live? Is that how your light is shining? But oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, physically and spiritually, because they are the gateway to your soul. But that's not you, is it? Oh, because you're filled with light. There's no darkness at all. It's not me, guys. I'm the first one to say it. I am a sinner saved by grace and I will be a sinner saved by grace until the day that I die or meet Jesus when he returns but I know without a doubt that I'm his own because he paid the price he was the spotless lamb I have carried put on his robes of righteousness my sins are cast away from me and I'm as white and radiant as can be and I will continue to ask Jesus to shine more and more in my life so that I can be more and more like Him as this world grows strangely dim. But verse 37 comes up next. As Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee, we're back to the religious hypocrites in this case, not that all of them were, a Pharisee invited Him to dine with Him. Okay, I, I, as he was speaking, so did he cut Jesus off at this point? Did Jesus get a breaking point? But it's going to add to the Scripture totally because as Jesus was speaking, I'm a Pharisee. And I'm going to invite you to dine with me. Okay? Not just a meal like we're talking about. We're, we're, I'm only going to invite you to hospitality and fellowship with me. But my heart is really far from you. You know my heart, but I want to look good, and I even think I'm doing good, maybe. So I'm going to invite you to dine with me. So he went in and reclined at the table. That position where shows that, you know, we're right, they all joined in together as family and friends. But the Pharisee was surprised to see that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. This is part of the Pharisee ceremonial cleansing again that was not part of the original law per se, but they had adopted all kind of laws. Like you say, you can only walk this far. You can only carry this much load. Uh, I don't know all of them, but part of it was if you carried something and then you sat it down and you picked it back up, that's doubled. You just, you just did what you shouldn't do. But who wouldn't get his ox out of a hole if his ox fell in it? There's so many things. You, you know, you've heard the, you g gasp at a gnat when you're swallowing a camel, right? I'm probably saying it wrong. That, that's because you were walking along. You ever had a fly fly in your mouth? Well, of course you want to spit it out, but the reason they spit it out is it just defiled them. And he said, you've tried so hard to spit out that fly, but, but you're choking on a camel, guys. You can't see that before you. Your hypocrisy is so bad, it's like a camel just flew in your mouth. Now then, said the Lord. It doesn't say Jesus said here. It says the Lord. You Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. How many times have you thought a cup was clean and then you looked inside and said, oh, it's nasty. 
Okay, if it is, do you want to drink from that cup? No. What do you want to do with that cup? Wash it again. Pretty simple. And Jesus is saying that about them. You are nasty. You still need washing. There's no way that, uh, that you can be used as a cup or a vessel because you're dirty still. Do you understand this? Then he says, you fools. If you go to Matthew's version, it says, you hypocrites, you hypocrites, you hypocrites. Luke doesn't use it. He says, you fools. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside as well? He's the only one that can cleanse you. He's the one that made you. But, but give his alms the things that are within you, and you will see that everything is clean for you. Woe to your Pharisees, a uh, terrible sentencing that woe is coming to you, destruction is coming to you, but also a chance to repent. Woe to you, Pharisees. You pay tithes of mint, rue, and every herb, but you disregard justice and the love of God. Again, you've gone way beyond the law in keeping it. Love the Lord your God. Honor your father and mother. Do not covet. You, you've, you've dedicated down to, if you've got 10 leaves of mint, you give one. You are really good at what you do at looking religious. <laughs> but you've neglect, neglected mercy and grace. You don't love your fellow man. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Woe to you Pharisees again. Notice there's three. I guess maybe that's where we get three strikes you're out from, but I don't know. I think it's more from baseball. <laughs> Woe to you Pharisees. You love the chief seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the marketplace. You've become prideful. You do judge others. How can your sins be forgiven if you don't forgive others? How can you... Not stand in judgment if you judge others. How can you not love your fellow man and love God in heaven? You love the prestige, the power, the glory of the things of this earth rather than loving the Lord your God and humbling yourself before Him and loving others. How could you ever get to the point where you thought the Samaritans were the scum of the earth, of the devil, when you yourself are the father of the devil. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves which men walk over without even noticing. Jesus is escalating on what he's saying here. And what he's saying here is you're dead. But it's not marked, it's not seen. The world doesn't know it. They come to you as light, but you're masquerading as light. And since you look that way, they are contaminating themselves. They are making themselves unclean. And the eventual thing is death. And we're not talking about physical death here. We're talking about eternal death. From you Pharisees who think that you're clean, but on the outside you might appear to be but inside you're filthy and only God can clean you. And I am the one standing before you as the light of men, the light of the world. Will you receive me? I could spend a bunch of time on this, but I just want to apply these to how it applies to us like that. So then you're sitting here thinking, okay, that was pretty rough. If you think you're religious, you're thinking that, and that's what they're thinking in that day. So then we read a little further. One of the experts of the law told him, okay, well now we don't have the people that's out in the public eye as much as the Pharisees, but these guys labored intensively to have the law as they had it. Many things added to the law that weren't necessary and everything else. Many things that were burdensome, as Jesus is going to say in, this, in a minute. But these were the guys, these were the lawyers that take the Constitution and, and what all it says and define it all for you so you understand it more thoroughly. And you get a document this long when you knew that you weren't supposed to speed. Right? Pretty simple. But, th but that's, that's what they did. And one of the experts in the law told him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us as well. They knew that Jesus just insulted the Pharisees. And they wanted to let Jesus know, You insulted me also. Boy, if that's not trying to justify myself again. Woe! To you as well, experts in the law, he replied. You weigh men down with heavy burdens, but you yourselves will not lift a finger to lighten their load. The reason you defined all these laws the way you did, and I think that's still typical of lawyers today, 
is so that you understand and don't break the law, but it's not clear to me it's a burden for me because i got no idea what this 100-page document says. There's no way I can do it all. It's a burden. But Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Take on my yoke. Let me carry the burden with you. You think it's, the load is going to be heavy and light, but I am there with you. The load will be light. It will bring you joy and peace like you've never understood. True riches in heaven and peace in all circumstances. Woe to you! You build tombs for the prophets, but it was your fathers who killed them. And that was going on at that time. They were building temples to honor all the prophets. But in their hypocrisy, their, their forefathers were the ones who killed the prophets. Are you trying to say you're better than them? You still are rejecting the Word of God, the truth. You're rejecting me. Everything that the, God, that the prophets speak of and the law speak of is Jesus in the flesh, the light of the world before them. And you want more proof and signs and you just flat don't believe because of your hypocrisy and self-righteousness. Verse 48, So you are witnesses consenting to the deeds of your fathers. They kill the prophets and you build their tombs. You are agreeing with them, not uplifting the prophets, because I know your heart. And because of this, the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles. Some of them they will kill, and others they will persecute. Verse 50, as a result, this generation will be charged with the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the foundation of the world. Why, did, why does Jesus say this? Well, we just started this this way. Because Jesus is the light. He is not hidden. He has been given for all men to see. And if they come into the light, they come into the light and believe and become children of light. But not if you're going to give reasons why you won't come into the light because your deeds are evil. Whether it's because of your ignorance, you're because of the things you want in this world, or because of your self-righteousness that you think you have. Be careful. The light you think you have is not darkness. From the blood of Abel, the first one that was killed for his righteous acts, to that of Zechariah who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary, the last of the Old Testament prophets, for God was quiet after that until John the Baptist. Yes, I tell you, all of it will be charged to this generation because God is standing before you. Greater is the opportunity here than any other generation. And I'm going to say it again. Greater is the opportunity to read and study God's Word and go to church today as in any other generation in this country. Will you stand up and be a light? And there is a lot of light in this country masquerading around that is pure darkness and evil. And you are children of light. Woe to you experts in the law, third one, for you have taken away the key to knowledge. You are, yourselves have not entered in and you have hindered, the, hindered those who are entering. Jesus sums it up with, you should have been light leading others into the light of God. You know it from God's law, but you distorted the law. You made it burdensome. You don't care about others. You can quote again, oh, as the other religious expert did, the, the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your mind, all, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and to love your neighbors yourself. I can put it all together. But Jesus said, go do this and live. I can't do this. I'm an evil, rotten, sinning, scoundrel turd. How's that? Can I say that from up here? but I'm saved by grace. I'm a child of God. I'm a new creation because of what Jesus Christ has done and my belief and faith in Him. And if I put my belief and faith in Him, I cannot be the same. I have to be different. I have to be radiant, shining His light for the world to see so that I build that ark, which is Jesus Christ, and my children enter in and I give the opportunity for everyone else who enters in. But of course I'm going to build that ark to save my family, which includes this family and anyone else I encounter because I want them to become children of the Most High, to be forgiven of their sins, to shine their light brightly until they meet Jesus Christ face to face. 
I don't want to be hindering. I don't want to be a stumbling block. I don't want to be scattering. Woe to you experts in the law, for you have taken away the key to knowledge. The keys to the kingdom of heaven have been given to you. You yourselves have not entered. And you have hindered those who were entering. Now the Bible also says to those who have been given, more will be given. To those who think they have will be taken away. But it also says to those who, that are been accountable, especially in ministers and everything like that, once you profess the faith, which these guys did, that they're going to be held even more accountable. Because people are looking at their light, but yet it's darkness. Now I say that because do you proclaim you're a Christian in your workplace, in your church, in your family, in your neighborhood? Because if you are, if you proclaim and you're not living like it, you're going to be held more accountable besides everything else. Are you a light? I hope so. Are you shining brightly for all to see? Be careful that the light in you is not darkness. Is the light of Jesus shining on you? Are you shining? Or is there any darkness that's hindering you and hindering others to enter in the kingdom of heaven? Father in heaven, I thank you. I praise you for the light of men that came into this world that gave up heaven to live a humble life, to suffer, to not have the things of this world that we are fortunate to have, to be mocked, to be betrayed, to be, as Isaiah said, to be what he put upon the before he went to the cross and then on the cross to be beaten beyond human recognition. To go to you, Father in heaven, to, to seek your will, even though humanly he wanted to pass this cup from him, this cup of suffering. And Father, we pray the same thing for, our, for ourselves. It's against our human nature to want to suffer, but Lord, I also pray that if I can suffer for the kingdom, Lord, I pray that you fill me with your word and your spirit to be able to do that. I don't go out and seek it per se, but I, but I want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ wherever that may go. I don't want things to hinder me. I don't want the sins of this world to entangle me. Create in me a new heart, Lord. And that means that, you, that I give you the permission to search it. For you are my God, my, my King, my Savior, my Lord. Help me to fix my eyes on Jesus. Help us as a church to do that collectively, Father to realize that we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, that we are tied together, that we need to support our brothers and sisters as much as possible, to comfort as the, as the Spirit has comforted us in this world, to, to, to uplift each other as we need to, Lord, to walk hand in hand, side by side, knowing that we are not only children of the Most High, but that we walk with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, that we walk serving the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that though we may be persecuted or not persecuted on this earth so much, Lord, that we walk and shine brightly to bring glory to You. We just thank You and praise You for You are worthy of all glory, praise, and honor. And we come to You in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.